Good morning, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Investigator Perspectives on Available Clinical Research Findings in Renal Cell Carcinoma. We're here at the uh, Hilton Hotel. Uh, we've done a whole bunch of uh, satellite meetings this weekend. I know a lot of people have been watching online. We had quite a few people here live today. Uh, but we're doing this webinar to sort of give you a little bit of live from ASCO what happened in terms of RCC, but also uh, review where we are today in general in the field. We have a great faculty today joining me today, uh, Dr. David McDermott from the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, and Dr. Monty Powell from the City of Hope in Duarte, uh, California. Today, uh, we're actually going to go through some basic issues in renal cell. Uh, all weekend long, we've been talking about this survey we just did over the last couple weeks of 75 general medical oncologists, but well, we asked them also about RCC, and they gave us about um, 800 questions. We picked a few of them out. We'll try to squeeze them in along with questions that we get from you uh, on this webinar. So we're going to start out talking a little bit about what happened here at ASCO, and then we'll sort of kind of dive into the general uh, topics that uh, we're going to get into. Particularly, we'll start out talking about what everybody has questions about, which is the management of metastatic disease. Then we'll talk about adjuvant therapy, also an area where there are a whole lot of questions. And we'll finish up talking about uh, non-clear cell. But let's talk about some of the papers that uh, came out. And one, uh, Dave, I'm curious what your thoughts are. We were chatting a, a little bit about this, uh, looking at the issue of continuation of IO mm -hmm. in patients who've uh, been treated with an IO TKI. And uh, I guess we saw uh, some data looking at uh, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about this study uh, looking at uh, Ip, uh, Nevo with CABO uh, in the second line. Right. So I think you're talking about the CONTACT-03 trial, right. mm -hmm. which looked at cabozantinib with and without atezolizumab for patients who had failed prior uh, PD-1-based approaches. You know, the good news for our patients is their overall survival is improving as the immune checkpoints move up earlier in the, our algorithm for treating patients. But there wasn't a lot of randomized data about how whether PDL1 can salvage a PD1 failure. Um, we do this in the clinic often where we cycle through all of these doublets. This study suggests that there's that that may not be a good strategy because essentially a Tezo did not add any efficacy to, to CABO, and it did add some toxicity. So until we have positive randomized data, we should probably pull back on that practice of switching from one PD-1 based combination to the other. The only sort of caveat to that is there is some evidence limited that, that ipilimumab in the setting of PD-1 failure has some activity, several trials suggesting IPI gives you about a five to 15% response rate, but once again, no randomized data in that setting. Yeah, well, you know, Monty, when we first started talking about, you know, continuing IO and progression, and thanks for correcting me there, it was a uh, Tezo. Mm -hmm. Um, my first thought was exactly what Dave just said. I, I hear a lot of people talking about in all cancers using ipinevo after single agent IO, but I was very surprised that two of you were telling me before we get started, you see people using doublets, sequential doublets, so, you know, it, uh, cabo nevo and then pembro linvatinib. That's absolutely right. You know, Neil, we're seeing this more and more in our clinical practices. Folks will actually sequence combinations of TKI and IO. And I don't think this is just a renal cell issue. Right. You know, my colleagues that have absolutely. had a cellular, for instance, might sequence Bevatezo with Lenpembro. You mm -hmm. see this across other malignancies. What I love about CONTACT3, and this study is very near and dear to my heart, uh, we just published it in The Lancet simultaneous with the presentation yesterday, is that it's a really pure comparison of the contribution of IO in the second line setting. CABO plus or minus. There are other examples of studies that have looked, for instance, at chemotherapy versus a targeted therapy plus IO and lung cancer. Mm -hmm. But this really gives you a sense of the contribution of that second line IO, and it's pretty disappointing. Right. So I want to ask you about a couple other orals there in uh, advanced uh, RCC. One I know didn't surprise you, but I just thought it was really cool uh, looking at the Checkmate 9 ER study in terms of health related quality of life. These quality of life papers are starting to get better. In the beginning, I could not follow like what it meant, but now more of these patient reported outcomes. And the thing that was cool about this, I mean, again, it's probably no big surprise to you, but just sort of thinking about it, 
was that in terms of quality of life, patients did better with the Nevo Cabo than Sunitinib, mm -hmm. which I think is a pretty a reminder of the pre-IO days when we were all debating about which TKI to use. Right. Is that what you see in your clinic? Uh, well, there are differences with the TKIs and side effects, which often translates to toxicity. I think one of the important aspects of that comparison um, is that in the in the 9ER trial, the starting dose of CABO is uh, down from 60 milligrams to 40, and that may contribute to reduced toxicity, better tolerability, um, fewer dose reductions, and improved quality of life. I think the question, though, for us is when you're reducing the dose, are you losing anything on efficacy? And that's a debate that we have, but it's certainly an active combination. It's pretty hard to separate out the doublets, too, in terms of efficacy, so it seems like it's working. But again, Monty, is that your experience? I mean, you know, Pembro, Lenvatinib, we hear lots of stories about Lenvatinib in general, you know, endometrial cancer, uh, HCC, not necessarily an easy drug to use, a lot of debate about toxicity. Does it make sense to you that specifically Cabonevo may be better tolerated than, you know, some of the other doublets? You know, I describe it to my colleagues as sort of like a Goldilocks story, if you will, where, you know, when we look at the dose of LEN that we use in the mm -hmm. second line setting for renal cells, 18 milligrams, we sort of up that in the front line setting with cabozantinib, mm -hmm. as Dave correctly pointed out, we're dropping the dose from 60 milligrams to 40 milligrams, and with axitinib, sort of staying at the same dose mm -hmm. in front line versus second line. And, you know, to me, this quality of life data really stands out as a differentiator. I tend to use more cabozantinib nivolumab front line uh, for my patients versus the other TKIO regimens. Um, and, and so I, I do think that from that perspective, it's very helpful data. Yeah, it's very interesting, too, because, of course, we've been watching these debates going mm -hmm. on about the doublets and, uh, you, know, the, you know, at least in terms of efficacy, you kind of get the feeling they're very similar, but... Very interesting in terms of tolerability. I want to ask you about another uh, oral in the advanced RCC section, uh, Dave. I've been fascinated by busulfan, busulfan and where that's heading. There's a paper with a, a belzutifan uh, plus lenvatinib and a, a clear cell. Can you comment on that and that strategy and where you see belzutifan heading? Right, so if you were to ask, you know, what's the next potential big thing for kidney cancer, we hope it's targeting the HIF2 alpha transcription factor, which is an important driver of, of clear cell kidney cancer. We haven't been able to target it, Belzutifan does, and has activity as a single agent with a 25% response rate in previously treated patients. It's now in a, a pivotal trial versus Everolimus. In the, in the salvage setting, we'll see what that shows, but the, we're now seeing combination data that looks interesting. You know, it's all single agent, but there is a biologic rationale, single, single arm. It's all, the rationale for targeting both HIF2 and VEGF, so we're seeing those combinations. There also is an adjuvant trial of HIF2 plus PD-1. So if HIF2 becomes a drug in kidney cancer, um, there are multiple companies looking at this, it potentially will impact all levels of treatment for kidney cancer. What do we know, um, Monty, in terms of tolerability, tolerability of belzutifan, any unusual issues there? You know, the, the things that sort of stand out to me in terms of toxicity, there's nobody that knows more than uh, about HIF2 than uh, Dave. He runs one of two kidney cancer spores in the country that's done a lot of work on this pathway. But hypoxia and anemia are the two things that really stand out to me as- Hypoxia? Hypoxia. Yeah. Like clinical hypoxia? Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, like shortness of breath type hypoxia? It, it, often associated, but sometimes disconnected with shortness of breath. So oh. it, if, if it becomes a drug, it will present a challenge, a learning curve for clinicians about how to manage it. But all in all, tolerability is much more favorable with a drug like belzutifan than with our TKIs, which have a longer list of I mean, toxicities. Do you need, ever need oxygen? Some patients do temporarily. It, it oh. quickly reverses when you lower the dose or stop the oh. drug. But it is, you know, your face says it all. It's one of those things that it's not something we're typically used to managing in our patients, and we're going to have to get used to it if it becomes an approved agent. Another new side effect. You know, we've got all these ophthalmic <laughs> things. We did a whole program just on eye issues and oncology. It's like every organ. So that's... Uh, can you just, like, explain a little bit more about the biology of, of this? Because particularly the sporadic. Right. Like, is, first of all, is there anything on NGS like to look for that helps predict whether people will benefit? Um, not yet, although we're looking, because it doesn't work in a lot of patients. So the question is why? And the question is, can we, you know, can we select ahead of time to make it more effective? 
Most uh, clear cell kidney cancer, those patients have a VHL mutation in their tumor, VHL being a tumor suppressor gene. So when you're missing it, you can't shut off the HIF transcription factor. So it accumulates and it drives a variety of genes that are pro-tumor. So the idea being if you can block the activity of HIF2, you can shut off a lot of these genes that, that cause problems for our patients. But it doesn't work in all patients, and we don't quite understand why, um, and we need to, um, so we can give it more selectively. Um, but the hope is that as we learn more, we'll increase the activity um, and, and help more patients, because we're doing more with, with VEGF blockade, we're just targeting one gene that HIF2 controls. Here, we'd be getting more. What do you do about the anemia? Well, that's interesting. With dose withholding the therapy, it improves, but we also are giving erythropoietin with belzutifan, and it quickly responds. So EPO is one of those target genes for HIF2. So when you block it, your EPO levels fall. If you give it you know, to the patient, they come back up, and patients feel better pretty quickly. So, uh, Mani, you're going to talk about adjuvant therapy and management of non-clear cell in terms of papers here at ASCO. One more data, adjuvant ipinevo was presented here. Any thoughts about that and why it's a negative trial? Yeah, you know, the data was first presented at ESMO last year, and there's an important update this year on some of the different histologic subtypes, pdl one expressing subsets. Um, but I, I have to tell you, I was shocked by this when I saw yeah. it last year. You know, after I saw the positive adjuvant pembrolizumab data, I thought, well, gosh, add CTLA-4 more impact, right? Um, so when the curves were you know, just completely overlapping, it struck me. Um, I think most of us have come to the conclusion there's probably a toxicity problem. Um, lots of people with grade three, four events, lots of people discontinuing therapy on, on nevo uh, lots of people getting steroids. Mm -hmm. Dave's made that point before. Um, so I do think that all of these factors probably really sort of temper the effectiveness of adjuvant nevo -ipi. So yeah, Dave, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. I mean, you think Pembro works. I say Pembro and Nevo should be the same. You've got Nevo there. I mean, is it that much of the steroids and all that really negate that effect? Uh, possibly. I don't think we really know. We, you know, we, but that's the, you know, I think that's the safest assumption. I think what's interesting though from Dr. Mozart's presentation this year is, as Monty alluded to, they're looking at different subgroups of patients and their benefit. And his numbers and his analysis were small, but they get at sort of a critical question, which I, I assume Monty's gonna get at in his talk, is who should get adjuvant therapy and who shouldn't? Um, most of our di direction with that approach is based on clinical stage, but here he's looking at biology and there's you know certain things that are associated with benefit that did seem to drive some outcomes even in that trial that was all negative for all comers, but in sarcomatoid patients, in PDL1 high patients, the activity seemed greater. And that might sort of give us a way forward to improve selection with adjuvant treatment, which is now the standard of care. So a few papers here in non-clear cell money, that's uh, an area of expertise for you. Uh, so first of all, uh, triplet, uh, Cabo, Nevo, Ipi. I'm curious about your thoughts about that, as well as in RCC in general. This is a non-clear cell that was presented here. We also saw data with uh, Nevo Cabo. Also, I didn't even think about this, sarcomatoid non-clear cell. Interesting in terms of impact of immunotherapy. What did you take away from these papers in terms of, you know, sort of non-clear cell? You know, we're starting to see this signal across multiple studies now where a TKI plus IO seems to really have substantial <laughs> impact in these non-clear cell histologies. I think the data for Len Pembro is quite compelling. Response rates in histologies like papillary of around 55%. Uh, the data you alluded to for cabo-nevo and histologies like papillary has a response rate of 47%. I do think that we need randomized trials in the space, and I think we've proven as a community that we can do that. And I'll tell you why, Neil. You know, you look at the small randomized phase twos that I've you know done in the past, mm -hmm. and they really have an influence guideline. Right. So one of the things we'll be talking about is phase three designs in the non-clear cell space that can ultimately displace drugs like sinitinib and so forth. Right. And still, in many parts of the world, represent standard of care. Interesting. So just want to point out also to the audience, there are a couple of educa RCC education sessions actually today, this morning, if you go check them out. I always love the ASCO uh, education sessions. Uh, uh, I noticed one of them is on oligomets. Any comments about that, uh, Monty, in terms of 
um, how often you per, or use strategies targeting you know, local therapy for ligametastatic disease. Yeah, I think the principles is starting to become pretty similar to other diseases mm -hmm. like lung cancer, colorectal, where you really start aggressively targeting oligomets and renal cells. We, truthfully, we've done this for a long right. time uh, with surgery. The, the data that I think is perhaps emerging and maybe more compelling nowadays is for SPRT and radiotherapy mm -hmm. in that setting. I'm getting more and more comfortable. You know, when I was in fellowship, you know, I was taught that radi uh, renal cells are radio-resistant disease. We're learning more and more that uh, oligomets can be effectively controlled with SPRT. I don't know if you do. Yeah, no, absolutely. We often integrate it with systemic therapy for places where patients' disease escapes. So, for example, bone mets, brain mets, and then often go back to you know, continuing what the patients were on with systemic therapy. So we work closely as a multidisciplinary group at most centers you know, to offer both approaches. So I don't know, but for some reason, my head just clicked into, uh, you know, we, as I mentioned, we're going to show you some of the questions of these 800 questions we got from oncologists, but I, I just flashed on one of them. I don't know why when you talk about oligomets, because it's sort of debulking in a way. Again, Monty, update, 2023 update on cytoreductive nephrectomy. The, kind of the way I've been hearing it is that the patient's not symptomatic and they have metastatic disease, particularly if it's symptomatic, treat systemically, hold off on cytoreductive. How often are you doing cytoreductive nephrectomies? You know, unfortunately, I think the 2023 update is we don't know, <laughs> which is kind of unfortunate. But, you know, we've had the pendulum swinging back and forth with trials done in the cytokine era and then the TKI era, uh, trials there being negative. Uh, we do have studies ongoing. There's a, a cooperative group study called PROBE, which randomizes patients to cytoreductive mm -hmm. nephrectomy or not. But I think the important point in the design of that trial, and this really reflects my clinical practice, is you get the systemic therapy regimen going, right? And then you make that decision around cytoreductive nephrectomy later. So you know, if you have that patient who's doing great, wonderful responses everywhere, I mean, I probably would not send that patient to uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy. On the other hand, if every other site's responding and all that's left is a primary, we do see cases like right. that, then maybe that's a place where you might consider really debulking in that case, you know, in the true sense of the word. Right. All right, well, we, we asked uh, both the faculty to do uh, short presentations, and then we'll le lead into uh, throwing out a bunch of questions from the uh, general medical oncologist. So Dave, uh, we ask you to talk about uh, the complex world of metastatic uh, kidney cancer. If you could uh, go through that for us. Sure, glad to, Neil. Um, a lot's changing, um, improvements in overall survival for our patients, which is great. Um, when we were doing this, maybe, you know, five or six years ago in your place in Miami, the standard of care was VEGF blockade first, then PD-1 is salvage, and that probably doubled overall survival for our patients, that sequence. You know, soon after, the question was, you know, can you combine these approaches? And there certainly was preclinical data that suggested you could. So looking at essentially the fusion of first and second line therapy, that sort of hit the big time with this study uh, four years ago, which was updated this year at ASCO, which is the keynote 426 trial, looking at Pembro and Axi versus Sunitinib. And most of these uh, randomized trials that have come out since have the same sort of design, which is VEGF PD-1 versus the old VEGF standard of care, and have shown similar things. The alternative approach, which has been looked at in other tumors, is two checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1 and CTLA-4. And Dr. Mozer showed us a few years ago that that was an active regimen. So what we spend a lot of time debating at these meetings, we now have you know, six positive phase three trials, four of which are positive for overall survival. And we spend a lot of time discussing, you know, which regimen should we use? And there are, you know, people who have different approaches. These are sort of my clinical take homes, which is essentially if you have aggressive disease, symptomatic disease, you need disease control. Well, PD-1 VEGF regimens have a higher response rate, a lower primary progressive disease rate, a longer PFS. So there are certainly pros to that approach. Uh, there are some downsides about chronic toxicity because you need to stay on both drugs, but less intensive immune-related adverse events, which is obviously one of the downsides of PD-1 CTLA-4. But for those, uh, those clinicians, those patients that are looking for a durable response, what we're starting to see is those emerging from that original Checkmate 214 data set. Um, so there are 
pros and cons. So what we see in the curves over time is, this is looking at the, the curves from Keynote uh, 426, is you see a, a drop off in some of those PFS curves. And ideally what you'd wanna see with immune therapy is what we see on the right side of this slide, which is a plateau on those curves. Whereas, and you see that it's across trials. So this is the PFS curve that was updated at ASCO GU, looking at 9ER, which is Nevo Cabo. You see a similar pattern. Um, also, in overall survival, though, maintained you know, across subtypes, which is great for that combo. Clear data, also impressive for those early endpoints, response rate, PFS. But you do see some fall off over time in progression-free survival. We debate what to do with favorable risk patients because there's no clear impact in overall survival in those patients, which is puzzling, um, and we, we, you know, we need to understand it more. Whereas with the CTLA-4 combination approach, you see less early activity, but you see that plateau um, now at 60 months, which was the most recent update um, in the PSFS curve. So there are patients living with durable benefits, some of whom are actually off treatment, in part because of the tox. So they're living in remission of their disease. So it becomes a trade-off of our patients willing and clinicians willing to accept the increased toxicity that comes along with that for a potential for a durable outcome. And it's not for every patient. It's not for every clinician. You need a team. This is sort of how I look at it, the pros and cons. And there, there are good justifications for either approach. Um, and the bottom line is moving PD-1 early has improved outcomes. This was something you, we were talking about before. This was what we hoped would be the next step. So this is sort of the kitchen sink approach of combining all the active approaches, VEGF blockade with CAVO, and then PD-1 blockade with NEVO, CTLA-4 with IPI. This is the so-called COSMIC 313 data set. This is a positive trial for its PFS primary endpoint. So this was met, this was published just a couple weeks ago in New England Journal. The issues with this approach, though, have to do at least with tolerability. There's more side effects when you add the triplet, particularly hepatotoxicity, and we haven't seen survival yet. So until we see survival, um, the application of this approach may be limited um, in the clinic. We'll have to wait. And if we don't get survival, this may not become an approved approach for our patients. Um, the biggest question, I think, in oncology, or one of the biggest, is what works after PD-1 failure. So we obviously deal with that a lot. There is good data going back several years. Dr. Schwery, you mentioned him before. Monty has certainly been part of this. With looking at cabozantinib, certainly approved there, certainly active there. Tavozinib is another player in this space. Monty's led a lot of this work. This compared here to serafinib, not just benefit compared to serafinib in the salvage setting, but durable benefit with a, with a clean toxicity profile, as, as you see here, and is certainly FDA approved. Dr. Atkins recently updated some of that data, and what you can see is durability, which we don't often see with VEGF TKIs. You see a separation in those curves that is lasting out to four years. So it, it's certainly having a role. It's moving up earlier um, in, the, in the algorithm, you know, potentially. You know, and this is a subgroup analysis for that TiVo3 study looking at treatment-related adverse events, um, which seem less uh, with TiVo than with some of the other regimens, that, uh, other TKIs that we've had, so maybe a somewhat cleaner TKI, which is an issue. So certainly VEGF blockade is a standard for a salvage setting in patients who fail PD-1. But the question which we were getting to before is, you know, does PDL1 salvage those patients? And this is the contact three design that we talked about. And at this meeting, we learned that essentially this trial is negative. Um, and so we, we probably shouldn't be doing that um, until we see positive randomized data. So hopefully, you know, if we're doing this again in a few years, what we'll get to is a more biology-driven approach we've sort of talked about, which is the treatment based on a profiling of the tumor and its microenvironment. And we'll get to having more patients living in remission, so second-line therapy will not be necessary. We're moving towards that goal, but we certainly have a lot of work to do. So just a little follow-up here, some of the questions we're going to talk about. But I've got to say that seeing that uh, uh, data that we were just talking about in terms of quality of life with the doublets really got into my head. I hadn't really thought about the issue of the TKI pairing. Right. And you know what we were just talking about that the with the cabo being a little bit lower dose and you know maybe a significantly better quality of life. I'm curious about because I know there are studies looking at TiVo plus IO. I don't know 
how far they are along or whether that's ever going to, but does that make sense? If it's, is, it's, is it, in your experience, better tolerated? You think a doublet with an IO would be better tolerated? You know, great question. Important study, TNEVO2, which is looking at tavazinib versus tavazinib plus nivolumab. Very interesting design there. So they're actually using the standard dose of tavazinib versus essentially two-thirds the dose of tavazinib plus nivolumab. The setting's also a little bit different, Neil. So it's for patients who have progressed on prior immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, it reflects right, the contact, the contact three, 3 design. Yeah. Um, so the study is going to be an important, I think, arbiter in some ways of, of the role of PD-1 post-previous immunotherapy. Right. Um, different question, important trial. Yeah, no, but to your point, I mean, I think the intensity of toxicity is greater with PD-1 CTLA-4, um, but the chronicity is the issue oftentimes with um, VEGF PD-1 strategies. And their factors come into play, like the half-life of the drug, for example. So for example, if you have diarrhea, which can happen with PD-1 and can happen with VEGF, how do you tell which is driving that toxicity? So the easiest way is to stop the drug. And some of these drugs have pretty long half-lives, so it's not easy to understand that. Whereas a drug with a shorter half-life, like exitinib, that, that patient will improve within 24, 48 hours. So you, it makes, in some ways it makes the management a little simpler with certain agents, but there are, there are trade-offs, you know, efficacy and tolerability for sure. What about the triplet approach, the cosmic approach? I mean, the, the hazard rate for, you know, recurrence is pretty significant. I think it's 0.63. Mm -hmm. I, granted, there's no survival, but you were alluding to the issue of tolerability. What actually do you see? Like, what's the problem? The, the I challenge. Liked, yeah, I like Dave's summary. I think a lot of it hinges on overall survival, which we haven't seen mm -hmm. yet in terms of tolerability, big issues, right? So the rate of steroid use was much higher with triplet therapy versus doublet therapy in that trial with Nevo at be alone. Uh, what's I wonder interesting, why, though. I mean, why, I mean, why would CABO affect so it was autoimmune a, toxicity? There's a placebo-controlled trial, Neil, mm -hmm. right? And I think that had a lot to do with it, right? Because you run into toxicities with these triplet regimens, in particular hepatotoxicity, and you don't don't really know what to chalk it up to, right, in a right. placebo-controlled trial. So no matter what it is, you're going to throw steroids at it, right? So I think that's probably what led to these higher rates of steroid use than I would have expected otherwise. Um, so lo lots of issues when it came to toxicity, liver being probably the most prominent. But, you know, until we really see a good signal, maybe in terms of OS, um, I, I just don't think it's going to pick up in the clinics. Right. So, so a lot of questions about sort of the ins and outs of using these therapies including in the chat room, Hassan wants to know, for patients with bone mets, is CABO preferable due to better bone efficacy? We've heard that. Curious about your thoughts on what the data is, and would you use it as a single agent or with Nevo if papillary? You're going to get to that in a second. But uh, any thoughts about CABO and bone mets? And also, one of the docs saw, uh, had a case that they sent in, six-year-old metastatic RCC on Nevo CABO, Restaging shows one new lesion in the jejunum, which incidentally I'm curious about that. Patient's clinically well. I guess you could say this is a ligo progression. So what about CABO and bone mets? And what about this case with the ligo progression, David? So the CABO and bone met story comes from like a subset analysis from previous trials looking at either Nevo CABO versus Sinitinib or CABO versus Sinitinib which seem to suggest a you know greater efficacy in those sub that subgroup of patients Th those numbers are small and we shouldn't overinterpret them but we've used that as justification for using cabo and bone mets and it, it tends to be what I do in my practice that said with, with the, bone mets are a big problem for patients from not just a quality of life but from a complication point of view and I don't think you can count on any T TKI dealing with that so you need to work together with your orthopedic folks and your radiation oncology folks. If so if someone has a bone met and a weight-bearing bone, I'm usually offering radiation to that bone um, so as not to deal with a pathologic fracture, which really can set patients back considerably. Do we use preemptive surgery? Um, our, our orthopedic surgeons are not big on that. Uh, they are often not, not to criticize orthopedic surgeons, but they're not able to predict when someone is going to fracture. But certainly symptomatic bone mets, we often try. If someone's having significant pain, it looks like the cortex is narrowed, we probably operate on them ahead you know, more so they don't have the complication. 
Uh, Monty, what about this jejunal met? Have you seen that with RCC? Yeah, I've had a couple of seconds to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, this is a case where I'd probably try to get the surgeons involved, and I'll tell you why. You know, I, I think these uh, METs and the GI tract really spell trouble in a lot of yep. cases. If these continue to grow, right, we know that further immunotherapy won't work. We know that switching TKIs might lead to bleeding-related complications mm -hmm. when you have tumors at that site. So I'd actually see if you could potentially get a surgeon to resect this radiotherapy I'm not excited about when you have Jejunal that right? The tissue there is right. just too friable. Sounds like a Lugo progression. He says the patient's doing well, no symptoms, they're under control. It's just this lesion. Yeah. So take it, Lugo Med, take it out right. and keep going, I guess. Right. Maybe the one thing to remember here is you'd want to probably stop the TKI with CABO maybe about a week or two ahead of surgery and then hold it for about a month after. Right. Um, so you do run some risk of progression in that time frame, but I think it's a necessary evil. That's a good point. How about this other uh, case, uh, Dave? Uh, 72-year-old man, severe pain from bone mets. We were just talking about bone mets. Patient was lenvatinib at Penbro. Any dosing recommendations about lenvatinib? That's a topic we talk about a lot, mm -hmm. particularly in, uh, with the gynecologic oncology and endometrial cancer. Half of them start a full dose, half of them start low dose. Again, I've been now my brain is more getting tuned into the TKI part of the doublet. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts, uh, Monty, about lenvatinib dosing? Yeah, you know, my, my philosophy here is that if you're going to use lenpembro in the upfront setting, you got to use the dose that was uh, put forward in the phase three trial. Otherwise, you're not sure what sort of benefit you're going to tease out of it. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a lot of colleagues in the community who might, you know, kind of dial down the dose to 10 milligrams or 14 milligrams. I just don't know what that does for the patient, frankly speaking. And you might be better suited using the standard dose of another TKI IO regimen. Um, I think that there's other diseases like uterine, for instance, where you may not have other suitable similar alternatives, but in renal cell, we're, we're fortunate to have such. Right. As, in addition to what Monty said, I think you should always be trying to maximize the dose, which often means backing off and ho or holding and then reintroducing it um, because patients can often tolerate a higher dose, you know, six, 12 months later than they might have right off the bat. And I think oftentimes too much of what I see is a permanent dose reduction in, you know, in regular practice, I don't think anything needs to be permanent. It should be adjusted based on the patient's time. I hear a lot from the gynecologic oncologist, Monty, about the first week or two on lenvatinib, mm -hmm. and they have these you know, things about how they follow people, check their hypertension, et cetera, et cetera. You do that in this situation? Absolutely, mm -hmm. and I give patients really specific instructions on dose reducing themselves. I told mm -hmm. them, do not try to be a hero and push yep. through at the highest dose. Call us, you know, you've got, the, the nice thing about levatinib is sort of the pills come in a manner that you can sort of titrate down the dose in many cases uh, uh, on an individual basis. So that makes the dose reductions a lot more easy. So some more questions. This is a good one. I've been thinking about this for a long time. I saw this whole thing about ipinevo and low, low risk or you know, indications for ipinevo. So uh, David, supposedly, uh, you don't use it for low risk, but yet you show those curves and people want to use it. Yeah, yeah, and, and we do. Um, it's not indicated there, but um, the act, once again, if you look at the short-term data, sunitinib is winning in the short-term in the Checkmate 214 study, but the long-term data suggests that nevo IP is really helping patients. There's a high CR rate there. There are patients who are having durable responses. There are remissions there. So I, I'm biased to having, wanting my patients to have that opportunity, so I offer it. Um, but there are, there are obviously some trade-offs. I, I wish we could give it more routinely. I wish we could advocate for it more routinely because when you look at the entire population for that study, it's a positive study when you look at all comers. So I think, in my opinion, I think the guidelines should change um, going forward. So we're getting a lot of response about the issue of surgery. That's a very practical issue. So Matthew in the chat room wants to know uh, how about dental extractions, root canal procedures, also, uh, Iyad wants to know uh, specifically exactly what your approach is with people at TKI IO who are getting surgery, Monty. Yeah, so I will say that I probably have a lower threshold mm -hmm. with dental surgery, simple surgery like that, where the bleeding might be confined, um, to actually just let them restart within a shorter time frame. So a week to two weeks is good enough for me in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's just based on my clinical experience. I don't know, Dave, what your practice is there. You know, I think the key issue is, is, is it above the gum or below? So if they're going into the bone, there will be patients, if they're on TKIs, who won't heal and sometimes can get an osteonecrosis situation, which is problematic. So the key is communication with the dental oral surgeon. 
so that they don't they understand the the healing issues and as Monty said not restarting the drug until they've approved the healing so we're going to go on in a second and talk about adjuvant and non-clear so just a couple more a lot of questions about uh, TKIs and uh, Monty again uh, questions about TiVo uh, what do you use second line can you talk about basically how you, how you sequence TKIs and in particular what do you do with people who are having problems you know I, I tend to be pretty you know dogmatic formulaic in the way that I apply therapy so I tend to start with Cabonevo uh, with most of my patients um, there's special circumstances sarcomatoid etc might go with a different option so most of my patients are getting Cabonevo up front and that sort of takes away one of the probably preeminent options second line which is cabozantinib so I tend to either use linvatinib or everolimus if I have a patient with really aggressive disease I find that regimen really hard to tolerate though, mm -hmm. so I'm actually putting most of my patients on TiVo right after Cabo and Evo. I find it to be better tolerated. You know, Dave did a nice job outlining the data for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they're asking about is uh, second line TiVo, really interesting. So uh, why don't we, um, yeah, we, have, we were just already talking about Belzudafan. That sounds super exciting. Uh, well, maybe at the end we'll talk about uh, where we think things are gonna be heading in metastatic disease over the next year or so. We might come back to some of these questions. We're getting some questions in the chat room, but I want to make sure I mean, it's good to just sort of look through some of these things. Oh, one, this uh, brings up an issue that we've been talking about this weekend in general, which is the use of IOs in people with prior autoimmune mm -hmm. disease, David. And uh, I think it was in our lung program, people were talking about the difference between a non-life-threatening issue like mm -hmm. arthritis as opposed to pneumonitis, et cetera. And uh, actually, somebody here asked a question about a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. How do you sort of look at pre-existing autoimmune disease when you're thinking about, for example, first-line therapy metastatic disease? Yeah, so it's a critical question. comes up a lot in the clinic. These patients were excluded from the original trial, so there's less data. But the data is starting to emerge because our colleagues in these other disciplines that help us are starting to collect it and work together. I think in general, my cut point of using it versus not is a balance between how serious is their autoimmune disease, as to use your term, is it life-threatening or not? So if someone has had life-threatening complications of, say, Crohn's disease, you know, that may be a no-go versus something like rheumatoid arthritis, where if it flares, we can still get control over it and, you know, um, not have long-term complications. You know, so there's, there's a balance there, but also it's about their disease. So if they, do they have metastatic disease? And if we don't get this under control, they're going to have a shortened survival. I'm more likely to treat there. But in the adjuvant setting, it's often a reason not to do it. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a conversation with not just the patients, but also with the, and building a team of folks who will help you manage these complications when they happen, because you do need their expertise to manage things that we don't deal with all the time. So I think I have a feeling I know which how you're going to answer this question from uh, Blaine in the chat room, Monty, and maybe particularly because now the answer is different than it was a few days ago. Patients who progress on Ipinevo use Cabo alone or Cabo Nevo? Yeah, so there's a, there's a trial ongoing in the cooperative groups right now to sort of address this concept in part, right? Uh, that's a pedigree trial which looks at dose optimization. You keep the Nevo going and add Cabo to it. I think the data, though, that we have right now from Contact3 that we reviewed really suggests there's no point in keeping the I.O. component going at this moment. Mm -hmm. I would just give that patient a single-agent TKI. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the data we have right now with adjuvant therapy and non-clear cell. Yeah, so I'll try to tell a little story around adjuvant therapy. It's complicated because we've actually had four studies reported out over the course of the past two years here, and I sketched out the general schema for each one of them. And, and there's probably more similarities and differences if you look across the eligibility criteria. So this study is near and dear to my heart. We published this in The Lancet last year, uh, Emotion 010. So this actually looks at patients, and this is a key criteria to look at, T2 grade 4 and T3 disease on up and also patients with resected metastatic disease. Um, the eligibility criteria I'm emphasizing here because of the consistency across trials, but this study was just dead negative. So adjuvant atezolizumab doesn't seem to work. Um, the next study I'll review is one that you've highlighted already, Neil, which is Checkmate 914. We saw some updates at ASCO this year. Very, very similar eligibility criteria, T2 grade four on up. Adjuvant nevo ipi in the case of this particular study, doesn't seem to work. And we talked about toxicity maybe being a driver of that. 
Third study here is uh, Prosper. A lot of people wondering how single agent Nevo might play out. And there is an arm of that previous study, 914, that's going to look at uh, adjuvant nivolumab versus placebo. This was an interesting design uh, around perioperative therapy. Dave can speak to this better than I can, but there's been some data for perioperative mm -hmm. immunotherapy and melanoma, for instance. Here, with a single dose of nivolumab followed by surgery, followed by continued nivolumab versus observation, again, dead negative. So you look at these three trials and it doesn't really give you a lot of hope for adjuvant immunotherapy and renal cell. But what really has stood out so far is the data from a fourth trial, um, which is the um, Keynote 564 study. So this is adjuvant pembrolizumab versus placebo. Pembrolizumab dosed at doses that are familiar to all of us for a period of one year. Um, and that study was actually positive for disease-free survival. Uh, there was a trend towards overall survival advantage in the context of that study. Um, so I thought that was quite impressive. And, and there's lots of reasons why the others might have been negative. O10, for instance, was looking at a PDL1 inhibitor versus a PD1 inhibitor, smaller sample size. The Prosper study, which looked at that neoadjuvant versus adjuvant design, ultimately pulled in a lower risk group of patients. Checkmate 914, as we alluded to with adjuvant nevo -ipi. lots of toxicity there. So many, many reasons for which that strategy might not have panned out. Um, I'm going to shift gears here and uh, we'll talk about non-clear cell. And this is, as you'd mentioned, Neil, an area kind of near and dear to my heart. So I spent a lot of time actually focused on this trial uh, early on in my career. So this actually looks at patients with papillary kidney cancer specifically. And the one thing we know about papillary kidney cancer that distinguishes it from clear cell kidney cancer is that it seems to be driven by MET. So we looked at this trial with sunitinib as a control arm versus cabozantinib, crizotinib, and savolitinib. All of those have properties by which they inhibit MET. Um, so it was, I thought, a rational design. Small study, 180 patients in total, but an ambitious study, I would say, in papillary disease. And what we showed here is that there was an improvement, as you can see on the left, in, in terms of progression-free survival, nine months with cabozantinib versus about five months with uh, sunitinib. Um, there was no advantage with the other MET inhibitors we looked at, crizotinib and savolitinib. If you look at the response rates associated with cabozantinib, clearly better than what we see with sunitinib, around 23% with cabo, 4% with sunitinib. The thing that really strikes me, though, is that if you look at NCCN guidelines, European guidelines, cabozantinib and sunitinib are still kind of neck and neck with one another in the papillary space. So, you know, I, I think what our community is probably looking for is larger, more definitive trials to really sort of change their current paradigm. Um, so to that end, there have been ambitious studies like Savoie, which actually is a randomized phase two trial. This looked at patients receiving, again, that same pure MET inhibitor, savolitinib versus sunitinib. But the important point here is they actually try to select out patients who had MET alterations. So it's, it's very difficult to do in these rare histologies. Um, they didn't accrue a ton of patients, uh, just 60 ultimately were included, but it shows you kind of an inter interesting signal here, 27% response rate with savolitinib versus just 7% with sunitinib, so that's encouraging. And in fact, there's actually a phase three clinical trial that's ongoing called Samita that's going to explore the same principle. Um, combinations, that was a big theme mm -hmm. for us when we were talking about clear cell disease today. Um, I think the combination data for non-clear cell disease is pretty encouraging. You know, if you look at the trials, I, I'll just point out some consistency across them. Cabo Tezo, Cabo Nevo, both of these trials have a response rate for papillary that's just, it's identical. It's interesting, 47% there. Um, data for Bevitezo, maybe a little bit less impressive, I would say. It's what you might expect since we don't see the same activity in clear cell, but nonetheless, response rate of 25% in papillary. And then Lempembro, the data was updated. Doesn't look so different now at ESMO, still impressive with a response rate of 53% in papillary disease. So these combinations are definitely very interesting, good response rates and so forth. There's also combinations that we might be interested in down the line looking at, you know, MET inhibitors with immunotherapy as they are in the Samita trial that I alluded to earlier. So lots of stuff going on in the combo space. But I do think we need more, and that sort of leads into this discussion around zanzalintinib. So zanzalintinib is the newest TKI on the block, also known as XL092. Uh, you may ask, why do we need another MET inhibitor? Well, this, this builds on an interesting premise with cabozantinib. It inhibits a lot of the same targets as CABO. So you've got MET inhibition, you have axle inhibition, and so forth. You also have inhibition of TAM and other kinases with XL092, but a shorter half-life. And, you know, you think about some of the limitations that we have in applying cabozantinib. Maybe some of that has to do with the half-life of the drug, some of the talks that we see with it. 
So it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out. You know, I think, you know, if we all put our drug development hat on, we know that we're going to have to look for unique settings in which to use this drug. Um, I've been involved pretty early on uh, with this agent in the dose escalation. So this is some of the data that we've presented today. We'll have a lot more in, in clear cell, renal cell coming up. Um, but what we see is an early signal of activity. I'm not going to dive into the minutia here, but if you look at the swimmer's plot on the right-hand side, what, what is really interesting to me is that I have had patients on cabozantinib, so a very similar drug when you think about the molecular targets, that have actually responded really well to zanzalintinib. So, you know, it suggests that maybe there's some, something beyond cabozantinib with respect to the way that the drug acts. Um, and with that in mind, we've launched one of the first trials with zanzalitinib um, in, in the context of uh, non-clear cell kidney cancer. Um, and so this is a big phase three trial, Stellar 304. It's actively enrolling right now. I encourage folks to reach out to me if they have any interest in this. But it takes patients who have unresectable metastatic non-clear cell disease, and we're limiting to three subtypes, papillary, unclassified, and translocation RCC. And we're looking at Zanza plus nivolumab versus sinitinib. And, and people have asked me, well, why is sinitinib control arm here? You know, you just did, you know, studies mm -hmm. sort of obviating it in papillary disease like PAPMET. And the challenge is that with phase two hasn't really led to a guideline change. My goal here is to see if we can kind of get these older drugs like sinitinib, you know, relegated to, um, you know, just the, the, the non, you know, sort of uh, level one evidence categories and push novel regimens like this afford for, for non-clear cell patients. So... I think I'll wrap up there, Neil. So my mind always goes to other things I've, I've heard, and uh, it, it's uh, interesting when you said, do we need, need, need another TKI? Have you ever heard of perturbrutinib? It's a bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and they, you know, there were three that were already out there. Who needs another BTK? Well, this thing causes a response to people who progress on BTK. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you keep looking, and hopefully you see something. Just to get back to adjuvant therapy for a second, uh, Dave, it's a very interesting uh, editorial in the JCO in the last, I think it was a couple weeks ago, by Ian Tannic mm -hmm. about the issue uh, of, uh, you know, this controversial issue of uh, adjuvant to IO. And he kind of came out anti. Any thoughts? Well, I'm fairly pro IO in the metastatic setting. I have a very different approach in the adjuvant setting because most of our patients are going to be cured with surgery. Um, so, blanket use of these. Agents should not be, you know, standard of care, and we've already seen how that works in melanoma. So, so for example, um, both PD ones are approved in stage three melanoma, but in our practice and in other practices, for three A patients, we do not advocate for the use of PD one, even though it's approved there, and that's a large chunk of our patients. Those are patients with micrometastatic um, lymph node involvement from melanoma. Um, so we have a conversation with patients. We talk about their risk, which might only be 15 or 20% of recurrence, and say, well, this drug might reduce that 40%, but the absolute risk reduction is only 5 or 6%. And do you want to try this and have a balanced conversation about the risk reduction and the toxicity issues? Because some of my worst outcomes with patients have been in the adjuvant setting um, with dangerous, even life-threatening toxicity. So I have a very different conversation with patients that I think we need to. We also need to do a much better job, as I alluded to before, in picking patients out for this therapy. We struggle in kidney cancer, but it should be based on biology, in my opinion, not stage, um, not clinical stage. So we need to insist that work gets done so we can narrow the application at a minimum to those patients who are most likely at risk, most likely to benefit. When you were talking before about your bar to use IO, a uh, patient with prior autoimmune disease, I was thinking, I bet you it's a lot different in the adjuvant setting Absolutely. than metastatic. You're already on the fence to start with, it sounds like, about, metastatic, about adjuvant. Yeah, no, it's, I, I wouldn't say I'm on the fence because I think the PEMBRO result is a clear result. I just don't think we should be blanket giving it to every single patient, and we need to really educate those people, which is not because there is real risk. It's usually in the fine print of a lot of these publications. But patients can have very bad outcomes in that setting. Yeah, and again, when you think about the fact they might be cured, it's terrible. Right, right. Any particular autoimmune uh, complications you want to relate to us? <laughs> well, the one, yeah, yeah I mean, the, the ones that are sort of seared in my brain are the ones where patients have actually died with wow. treatment. 
So I had a patient who once got one dose of PD-1 blockade and got a horrible myositis that affected every muscle, including cardiac muscle. So that patient spent a year on a ventilator before dying. Wow. So that's like, that leaves a mark, you know, on the family, on the patient, obviously, but family also you. on the clinicians. So it, when that, ha so I think what might happen if melanoma is a guide is in these other tumor types, if we see more bad outcomes in our clinical practice, we might do what we're doing in melanoma, which is try to be more rational about this application. So uh, some questions that we got in our survey, Monty, adjuvant therapy, non-clear cell, adjuvant therapy after metastectomy. Yeah, you know, I have to tell you in the non-clear cell space, not a big fan of adjuvant therapy just because we just don't have any data there. And I, I'm hard pressed to think that we'll have studies mm -hmm. in the near future that address that, unfortunately. Dave, uh, treatment of sarcomatoid RCC, we were alluding to that before. So it's great to have this conversation. Prior to the PD-1 era, these were our patients who did the absolute worst. VEGF TKIs do not do much for these folks. Uh, they have very short survivals, but the PD-1 story is very exciting. These are, and we see this in other tumor types as well, where some of the worst biology responds the best. That's probably because these tumors are so aggressive, they generate an immune response, which is being blocked by PD-L1 expression. So we've known for a long time that sarcomatoid tumors have a lot of PD-L1 expression in their microenvironments. So when you come in in that setting with a drug that blocks PD-L1 or PD-1, you get a lot of activity, not just in the short term where responses can be north of 50%, but in the, more importantly, in the durable long term where we, we look at Ipinevo and a PF, you know, PFS at five years, you know, 40, 45%. Those patients are alive, you know, without progression, without secondary therapy. And in some ways, sarcomatoid is the best biomarker for response that we have. So we, when we see it, we use it, we get aggressive about immune therapy in those patients. Interesting. So, uh, Monty, uh, someone has a patient with an ALK mutation with renal cell. If you can you use ALK inhibitors? I'll throw in uh, BRCA. Yeah, you can use PARP in somebody who's got a BRCA mutation. Yeah, so for the ALK question, I promise I didn't plant it, but I, I did publish a series on ALK mutated really? renal cell a couple of years ALK, ago. Really? Yeah, lucky, lucky me. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, actually I had three patients with papillary RCC, so now there's actually an official World Health Organization designated a subset mm -hmm. of renal cell that's ALK altered. Wow. It's an exquisitely rare population. It's a needle in a haystack, but if you find it in my series, actually, patients responded to electinib very well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we actually had some uh, patients who'd failed prior VEGF inhibitors put on an electinib and really a transformative response. Not necessarily a durable response, right. but a good response nonetheless. You know, your question around PARP is an interesting one. Um, you know, I have a colleague, Yasser Gad at Hopkins, who's very interested in this question. You do see a reasonable proportion, not a very high proportion of patients with DDR alterations and renal cell carcinoma, but the data that I'm aware of for PARP and renal cell isn't particularly encouraging. We were talking the day before about CMET, and of course in lung they've got a couple of MET inhibitors, they've got a bispecific. What about CMET mutated uh, RCC? Yeah, I think Monty's work suggests you should try to block both VEGF and MET at the same time, and, and more selection, more selective agents are not necessarily more active. So I, I would go with what Monty was suggesting, which is you know something like cabozantin, which gets both of those targets. So questions about I don't know if you would call it Zanza. We always try to look for nicknames these things. I can't remember how to say it. A lot of questions about that. Uh, where do you see that heading? Is there, there's a phase three trial right now? Uh, there is, so that was that non-clear cell study right. that I alluded to, and I'm sure there's gonna be more in the works for Zanza or Z squared. I'm trying to think of a good, <laughs> cool, catchy name. Um, but you know, I do think that there's still other potential applications for drugs. You know, I, I always think that the ultimate trial that we really need to do now in renal cell carcinoma is a trial that uses molecular selection. I mean, Dave's contributed a ton to this body of evidence mm -hmm. that looks at genomic profiling and associates signatures with patients who are driven by angiogenesis versus patients that are driven mm -hmm. by, for instance, uh, um, immune-related pathways. And given the equipoise that we have now, looking at you know regimens like nevo ipi versus TKI plus IO, I think it's like uh, more important than ever mm -hmm. that we start looking at some of the work that you've done, Dave, in a prospective fashion. And maybe that's where a drug like Zanza gets inter integrated. Right. Who knows? Interesting. So some more questions we were talking about on immune toxicities. 
Uh, someone has a patient who got ipinevo, David, and got hypoadrenalism, hypothyroidism, uh, and we were talking about this in the lung cancer program the other day. Any data between correlation of immune-related adverse, this is an age-old question, and efficacy. Uh, and with Friday night in lung, they were saying maybe skin toxicity specifically is associated with benefit. Yeah, I, in kidney cancer, I don't know that we know of a specific tox that leads to a greater, you know, out, improved outcomes. I think in general, immune toxicity is associated with better outcomes. You're essentially breaking tolerance in those patients. Um, but aggre un aggressive treatment of the toxicity, I think the important point, does not shut off that immune response. So uh, if you see something, it's worsening, we have to act. You know, we do much more holding of treatment if we see mild toxicity, because if you, if you give a dose of Nevo or Nevo Ipi in the setting of mild tox, you'll almost certainly make that worse. So skin tox gets worse, diarrhea gets worse. So I often tell the patients, as long as you're having side effects, you're on the drug. You know, your immune system is boosted. It's going to do what it's going to do. Um, and I don't try to push. And we are aggressive about immune suppression to get things under control, knowing that it's not necessarily going to cause their disease to grow. We also had a question about, you know, there's been this interest out there, Monty, in the issue of antibiotics and IOs. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? You try to limit antibiotics in your patients on IOs. Yeah, you know, I, I do try to use it only if it's necessary. I feel like that body of evidence is pretty clear now. Yep. There have been large-scale meta-analyses, not just in renal cell, but also incorporating patients with lung cancer and melanoma, and really does suggest some diminution of effects, even trying to control for other comorbidities and factors that lead to antibiotic use. Um, so unless we absolutely need to do it, um, I, I, I avoid it. I will say at this ASCO meeting, we had some interesting data. One of my fellows presented uh, data related to a live bacterial product, actually an oral uh, probiotic, if you will, mm -hmm. that seems to complement the activity of Cabo Nevo. A couple of years ago, we published in Nature Medicine a paper that looked at Nevo Ipi with the same probiotic that augmented outcomes. So I'm glad you touched on you know, antibiotics and the microbiome, because I do think it might be a part of the future of, of kidney cancer and other diseases. Interesting. Let's see if we can take a couple more questions from the oncologist. But I promised everybody I would tell you we have the abstract tumor treating fields, second line therapy. I know these guys are like, what are we talking mm -hmm. about? Second line therapy in non small cell. A lot of people out there. So then the question is they have a phase three trial, they're reporting a survival benefit. Everybody want to know is what's the hazard rate? So I'm, this is what I'm reading, the presentations later this morning, 0.74. So not bad, not a home run. Can't wait to see what people have to say about it. Who knows, maybe it's going to come to renal cell. All right, let's get back to uh, immune-related toxicity. So David, uh, somebody has a 65-year-old man, got ipinevo myocarditis. You were talking about some of the life-threatening complications. What have you seen in terms of IOs in the heart? Well, those t toxicities are rare, but they are dangerous um, and potentially life-threatening. Part of the problem is being suspicious of it. So they often can present, for example, with just profound fatigue. Um, and when someone has fatigue with IO, it just could be the drug. Fatigue is one of the most common side effects, but fatigue could also mean myocarditis. It could mean the you know hypothyroidism. It could be panhypopit. So it's all about suspecting you know, in someone with new fatigue. But they're really in heart failure. Yeah. And so you've got to, you've got to be checking, you know, CPKs, you know, oh. that sort of thing, <clears throat> uh, troponins in those patients. You've got to be on the lookout because early intervention matters. And if you miss that issue, like in the patient I was describing who had that complication, she went to the ER, didn't get a cardiac workup, and then, you know, went... You know, went downhill pretty quickly. It's all about you know prior suspicion. If you think this could happen, it can be detected. They're now exploring novel agents beyond steroids for patients with myocarditis. There's a whole group of cardiologists across the country have come together to try to deal with this because we're going to be seeing it more now that we're bringing this these drugs to so many different indications and bringing it earlier. So we we need more research. We need more novel agents. So, uh, Monty, another question about itching. Do you, use, do you see it uh, with IOs? Uh, the person wants to know about acetylcysteine, photodynamic therapy, naloxone. Have you seen severe cases of pruritus with IOs? 
You know, I, I certainly have, I mean, to the point that, and this is a side effect that oftentimes lingers and bothers patients mm -hmm. well into their duration of treatment. Um, so I've considered if the patient's having a good response, discontinuing on occasion, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if they're, have, if they're doing well. I think the topical steroids have been more than enough for the vast majority of my patients. And Dave, have you used any of those other strategies? We, we have, and when topical therapy doesn't work. So some patients have needed those agents for symptomatic control because it becomes a major quality of life issue and doesn't always go away quickly. So I've actually had a couple of patients needing steroids for that problem, which is something you would like to try to avoid for something that's not life-threatening, but it can be certainly life-altering to have that kind of itching every day, all the times of the day. It prevents people from sleeping. You know, once again, it's all about integrating your care with your derm team and doing prospective research because most of what we have for these rare cases are anecdotal reports, and that's probably not good enough for us to get sort of a unified approach for this. So, Monty and Dave, uh, thank you so much for working with us today. Audience, thank you for attending. Come back uh, next week after we recover from this ASCO craziness. We're going to talk about GI cancers on June the 14th. Be safe, stay well, and have a great day. Thanks a lot, guys. Great. Appreciate it. Thanks for inviting.